Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So my name is Sarah Frederick. I've been working for the Heritage Trust for a few years now. Um, so I'm kind of helping out with programs this summer. Um, so this is our first in a series of three to four night skies tours. Um, we're doing it virtually. The weather just wasn't quite cooperating for us today. Um, we're hoping that um, our next one in July will be actually in person so we can see all the stars. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to John. He's kind of our expert for all the night sky stuff um, to get started. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is John Meter. I am the owner and director of Northern Stars Planetarium, which is an inflatable planetarium. I travel to elementary, middle schools, and libraries, and basically being self-employed, anyone who wants to hire me, and teach astronomy to school kids and family groups and, you know, all kinds of land trust groups like this. And what we're going to do this evening is take a look at the sky you'd see outside tonight. So I'm going to take the screen and we're going to move over to my program, which is the screen sharing. Give me a second here and we'll make it full screen. Get my little face out of the way. I don't need to see myself while I talk. If you have questions during the program, um, I guess it, you can send them into the chat. I'm not going to be monitoring the chat, but Sarah is, and she can interrupt me if she thinks something's really pertinent. At the end, we'll take some questions uh, in general, but feel free to throw things in the chat at any point. We may save the question to the end, or if it's really important at the time, then Sarah will take over. So right here, we're looking at the sun uh, just before sunset, what it would look like tonight if it were clear. Nice thing about programs like this is we can get rid of all those clouds that we've been dealing with all day long. And this is a, about 7.15, so it's a about 45 minutes ago. And what I like to notice, if any of you were involved in the last time we did this, which was right after the, the spring equinox, at that point, the sun was setting almost due west way over here. We speed it up tonight. We're going to find, since we're just past the summer solstice, that's when it sets as far north as it ever sets. It's starting to head back south again, but I will speed it up and you see it's way up almost to the northwest. We'll let it go down and wait till about nine o'clock before it really gets good and dark. We're going to stop right about, let's go just out here longer, right about there. And now we're at just after 10 o'clock, believe it or not. It's really pretty late this time of year. It's hard doing star parties in June because it doesn't get dark enough to see much for stars before 930. And even though the sun goes down around 820 and 825, something like that. So this is the sky you see tonight, around just before 10 o'clock, thereabouts. And we're going to begin by looking at some constellations, and then we're going to dive into them as we go and see some interesting things you might see, either with binoculars or perhaps a small telescope. And I always like to start with something easy. And I always suggest we start in the western sky because the stars rise and set just like the sun. They rise in the east, they cross the sky, and they set in the west because the stars aren't moving just like the sun's not moving. The earth is turning under our feet. We're all headed towards the east right now at about 950 miles an hour. Day and night, it doesn't stop. If it did, we'd all go flying into the wall at 950 miles an hour. So it's a good thing it's a nice steady motion. So that means, though, that the stars in the west are going to be the first ones to disappear. But there is a group of stars high in the western sky that I like to begin with. And it's in the high in the west right now. In the winter, it's different. But right now, it's high in the western sky. And I like to start with something people are familiar with. And I think the things people know, if they don't know anything else, is they know the Big Dipper. So if you look high up, you can see the Big Dipper right here. We've got three stars for a curved handle and four stars for the pot or the bowl. To me, it looks like a pot you cook with on the stove. Here's the handle you grab. Here's the pot. And you put some mac and cheese in the pot and you get your lunch cooking. Now, technically, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. It's what we call an asterism. Asterisms are groups of stars that are easy to recognize and we can imagine them as something. This is actually part of a much larger constellation called Ursa Major, which means Great Bear. You can see the Big Dipper kind of hidden in there in the Big Dip, Great Bear, but Ursa Major takes up a few more stars. We come way out to a nose out here in front for the bear couple front legs coming down underneath and a couple back legs here, kind of a long legged bear. And then the handle becomes the bear's long tail. Now, if you know anything about bears, you know, they don't actually have long tails. And there are lots of interesting stories explaining how the bear in the sky gets his long tail. 
Now, if you go and find a book on constellations, or if you're a modern person, you go get an app or two for your phone or your laptop or your tablet, and you look up the Big Dipper and see they draw the lines, you'll find they all come a little differently. They use the same stars, but they might connect the dots a little differently. After all, today, the way scientists divide up constellations is they just put a big boundary around a group of stars. And they say anything within that big red polygon is part of Ursa Major, the great bear. So you can connect the dots any way you want. Traditionally, if you look at books, you don't see that. You don't see these lines. You see a great big ghostly image, which is always kind of cool to see. Though if you go outdoors, you're never going to see a ghostly bear floating in the sky like that. But it does help some people visualize the bear better. I personally just like the dot to dots and kind of make a dot to dot picture. Now there's two things I wanna show you here if you do have a telescope. And the first two things we're gonna dive into are right underneath the pot. So here is the pot, this little rectangle right here. To this far end, in here, we're gonna zoom in. And if you have a telescope, you're gonna get really in close. You're gonna see a little spot that looks kind of blue. Do you see that little blue spot right there? Well, that's called the Owl Nebula. Let's zoom in on it closer. I'm gonna to have to center it here so we can see it well. And the Owl Nebula is a dead star. Now stars don't last forever. What stars are doing in their core is they're turning hydrogen into helium. That's called nuclear fusion. That's what happens inside a hydrogen bomb. When that happens, it creates enormous amounts of energy. And as long as this hydrogen to turn into helium, stars just keep on shining. When they run out of fuel, stars like our sun, the, the fuel's gone, so the reaction stop, and the star shrinks a little bit, and pressure builds up around the shell, and sometimes the helium starts fusing into carbon and other things. The star can swell up and shrink a couple times, and eventually, if it's a medium-sized star like our sun, the, the fusion starts happening outside the core, and it ends up pushing the outer layers of the star away, making a giant shell that expands outward. And that's what we're looking at right here. That's what the Owl Nebula is. This was a star that was similar in size to our sun. Now our sun is a million, 200,000 times bigger than the earth. So it's a pretty big object, but as stars go, it's kind of average. There are stars much, much bigger and much more massive and they die differently. I'll show you one of those a little bit later. But medium-sized stars like our sun always die in these types of objects. They're called planetary nebula. They have nothing to do with planets, but you can see they're round like a planet. And when they were first discovered back in the 1700s, uh, they'd, the planet Uranus had just been discovered in 1781. And so a lot of people were hunting for planets. And these seem to have a little color like that blue color you can clearly see. And so people confuse them to think they might be planets. Well, they're not, but they were became known as planetary nebula because they mimicked the shape of a planet. This one's called the Owl Nebula because of these two dark areas kind of, I guess, resembles the eyes of an owl. The other cool thing about finding the Owl Nebula is right beside it, there's a little galaxy over here. It's actually not little, it's very, very big. Uh, this galaxy is called the Surfboard Galaxy. Let's zoom in on it, I'll center it here. And this Surfboard Galaxy is also known as M108. And uh, it is about 45, 46 million light years away. That's an incredible distance. Remember, a light year is not really a length of time. It's a distance, like an inch is a small distance. A foot is a bigger distance. A mile is a bigger distance. A light year is the distance a beam of light will travel in one year's time. And light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. So at the speed of light, you can go all the way around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. That's pretty fast. If you go that fast in a straight line for one year, that's one light year. This object is 45 million light years away. That is a very, very long way. And uh, it's a galaxy, it's a spiral galaxy, and we live in a spiral galaxy. Here, if you're looking straight down at it from the top, it would look like a spiral, kind of like a hurricane looks with spiral arms. But they're round like that, but they're kind of flat if you look at them edge on. And we're looking at this one edge on. We'll see a few that are not edge on before we're done here. This one's called the surfboard, and you can kind of see why. The interesting thing with a wide angle uh, eyepiece in your telescope, you can see both these objects in the same view. And they're easy to find because they're right beside that star. 
in the corner of the Big Dipper's pot. So that's Urger, the Great Bear, or within it, the Big Dipper. Now, once people find the Big Dipper, the next thing they often want to find is the Little Dipper. To find the Little Dipper, go to the back two stars of the Big Dipper's pot, these two right here. Their names are Merrick and Doobie. Where you draw a line from Merrick to Doobie and you keep on going, and it's going to point you to this star. And this star over here is probably the most famous star in the entire night sky. It's known as the North Star. Its real name is Polaris, but we commonly call it the North Star, because as you can see, it's directly above north. If you draw a line from it to the closest spot on the horizon, it'll always point north. That's because it's directly above the Earth's North Pole. And you can use it like a compass to find your way. It's the only star that does that. The other stars all slowly move. They rise and set, and they draw circles around the star. This one doesn't move at all because it's right above the axis the Earth spins on. And it also marks the end of the handle of the very faint Little Dipper. The Little Dipper starts at the North Star and bends up these faint stars here to this little square. Let's put some lines on that and you can see it a little better. Now, if you lived in Portland, you won't see these stars. You'll see the North Star and you'll see the Big Dipper. And you might see that star, star named Kutchum. These stars are so faint they get washed out by the street lights of a city like Portland or even a city like Bangor or Waterville. But in a place like Rangeley, you got some nice dark skies up there. So you'll be able to see those stars if you can get out from underneath the clouds. So that's the North Star and the Little Dipper right there. And the Little Dipper is also known as the Little Bear. But we don't add any stars to make it into a bear. And it too has a long tail. Go figure about that, huh? Well, once we find the two bears, one more uh, early summer constellation you want to catch early. It's underneath the Big Dipper. Look under that pot and look low in the western sky around 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and you're going to see a group of stars that shape like a backwards question mark right in here. It starts here, and it curves around, and it comes down with a dot. It makes a nice question mark. It's just facing the wrong way. It's backwards. Well, that's part of one of my favorite early summer constellations called Leo the Lion. It's only going to be visible for a couple more weeks, then it'll disappear and it'll become visible again next February. Disappears by the early July. Now to see Leo, we're going to use the curve of the question mark as the furry mane on the back of his neck. And his head, his face is over here where there aren't any stars. You have to pretend that part. We come back to these two stars and make a big rectangle, and that's the lion's body. And come down to Regulus, the bright star, which is the dot of the question mark. We often refer to that as the lion's heart. He has a leg here and a leg there. Come back up his belly. There's a back leg and another back leg. And he's got a tail right there. Let's put some lines on him. You can kind of get, they don't draw the legs in, but you can see a leg here and here. And one here and one here. And there's his tail. So there we find the two bears and Leo the lion. Now that star that I selected there in Leo, that's a really interesting star. It's not the brightest star in Leo, but it's interesting. It's called Algeba. And the thing that's neat about Algeba, let's shut the lines off for a second here, is if we zoom in on it with a small telescope, you start to see a little color. You might notice it looks a little bit yellowish, but if you have a, a telescope and you zoom in, it very quickly will split into two stars. It's a binary star. The two stars orbit each other, just the way the sun has planets going around it. Many stars have another star going around it. And once you split it into two, you also notice that the two stars are two different colors. The larger one has, in slightly brighter ones, can be set of a yellowish orange, while the other one will have a bluish tinge. The different colors is because they're different temperatures. The orangish yellow one might have a surface temperature of around seven or 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit while the blue might be 25,000 degrees. Blue is a hotter color than yellow. Blue, if you think about a gas grill, you want a blue flame because it's hotter than a yellow flame. Well, there we find two stars or orbiting each other, but with your eyes alone, you can't see them too. They're too far away and too relatively close together so that to our eyes, it looks like a single star. So that's right there at the shoulder where his head meets the, the curve of the, the question mark or the mane of the lion. One more thing I want you to notice, a couple more galaxies. Now we've seen one galaxy up by the Big Dipper, but right by Leo's hind leg right here is what we call the Leo triplet. 
And this is three galaxies. This is a part of the sky that is really rich in galaxies. If you want to hunt galaxies, you could spend in this whole area just around Leo and the nearby constellations and find hundreds of galaxies. These three are called the Leo triplet because you can get them all in one field of view really easily. The top one up here is called the hamburger galaxy. I guess someone thought it looked like a hamburger with the, the dark clouds going through the middle, maybe being a piece of meat or something. Um, people would get imaginative with these names. The Hamburger Galaxy is 35 million light years away. So it's a little closer than the one we saw before, which was 40 something. And, uh, and it's edge on too. So remember, look at that edge on. I want you to remember that because it's something important. I want to tell you about that in a couple minutes when we get there. Now, the other two are spiral galaxies. The, all three of these are spiral galaxies. I'm going to stop my clock here for just a second so they don't zoom out for me. But this one, like the first, is edge on. This one is kind of at a 45 degree angle. And this one here is called, um, oh, what's it called? It's called M65. M stands for Messier. Charles Messier in the 18th century was a comet hunter. He was hunting for comets in the sky. He didn't care about galaxies. We didn't know what galaxies were back then. He didn't care about all these nebulies, these little fuzzy spots in the sky. But they looked surprisingly like comets in early telescopes. So he knew they weren't comets because comets move and these don't move against the background of stars. So he just started labeling them. And he labeled 109 of them. So this one right here is M65. And this is a, we now know as a spiral galaxy. We're not looking edge on, but not flat down on either, but at a 45 degree angle. But you can see the spiral arms coming around here. And you see the dark clouds, those are dark clouds of dust floating in the, in the galaxy. And lots of stars here and some dark uh, lanes going through the middle. Almost all galaxies have a very bright core in the center. And we pretty much found that they almost all have a giant black hole in the center the galaxies too. Now some galaxies like the neighbor over here have a lot of pink spots on them. Let's center this one and zoom in. This one's M66. Now the Messier number. This one's called a barred spiral. Now there are two kinds of spirals. There are spirals that you know just spiral out from the center and they may have two, three, four, five arms. And then there are barred spirals that rather than having just a center with spirals coming up, they have a bar across the middle, kind of extended core, and then the spiral arms come off the ends. So some people believe, most scientists today believe the Milky Way, our galaxy is a barred spiral. But what you notice here is all these pink patches, those are what we call hydrogen two gas clouds. Those are places where stars are forming. We have those in our galaxies. I'm going to show you some in a couple of minutes. But we see them in this galaxy. We didn't see them in the other one. And its neighbor over here doesn't have many. And this one's loaded with them. And scientists have found this one. It's, you don't see them as clearly because it's edge on. But we know these two galaxies once interacted. When two galaxies interact with each other, their gravity stirs up the hydrogen and creates these star forming regions. So we think these two, these two galaxies, which are both similar distances away, about this one's 33 million light years, this one's 35, whereas the other one over here is 41 million light years. So it's you know another uh, five or six million light years further away. They think these two interacted and that's what created all those star forming regions. But the Leo triplet is very easy to find. You don't need a large telescope to find it. It's right under the hind leg of Leo the lion. Just scan in there and you'll find those three fuzzy patches of light. Very cool place to look. So now go back to the Big Dipper. We'll zoom back a little bit, look above Leo. And we find the Big Dipper or Ursa Major. A secret way I tell kids to find Leo is just grab that Big Dipper by the handle, take the pot, bang it down, and you'll hit Leo right smack in the back of the head. Seems to work every time. Just don't do that to real lions, I'm told. Now, we find everything we found so far, we use the Big Dipper. We use the pointer stars to find the North Star and the Little Dipper. We banged it down, we found Leo. Now we're going to use the handle of the Big Dipper. You see how the handle curves or arcs? Well, follow the arc down and it points you to this very bright star, which is actually the brightest star in the northern hemisphere of the sky, north of the equator, celestial equator. It's a star named Arcturus. And so you remember you follow the arc to Arcturus. And Arcturus is in a constellation, it's one of my favorites, and most people, unless you're an astronomer, have never heard of it. It's called Buites, and Buites was the herdsman. 
Well, he's a herdsman and he's also known as the bear chaser because he's chasing the great bear. Remember, Ursa Major is a great bear across the sky away from his herd. Now, while the big bear doesn't really look much like a bear when you get down to it, that's why we usually just draw it as the big dipper, while Leo does kind of look like a lion, the herdsman doesn't look like a man. Not at all. I'm not even going to try to draw it as one. I see Booties as an ice cream cone, another way, asterism, or another way to see it. Think of Arcturus as the point. There's one side of the cone here, another side of the cone there, and there's the opening on top. So this triangle is the cone, like a sugar cone. Good constellation for summer, huh? And then we've got a big circle of mediumly bright stars like that. And that's a big scoop of ice cream. I think every star is a chocolate chip because I like chocolate chip ice cream. So we can draw the lines on there if you want. They don't make it an ice cream cone. They don't draw the line across. Some people call it the kite because it kind of looks like a kite as well. A lot of kids notice after they see this ice cream cone, this nice little half circle behind it right here. That's a little constellation called Corona Borealis, which means the northern crown. Now don't go calling it the crown because if there's a northern crown, that implies there might also be a Southern crown, which I'll show you in a minute too. And there's another constellation called Cassiopeia the Queen. And that's a W-shaped group. And while it's often drawn as the queen sitting on her throne, a lot of kids say it looks a lot more like a queen's crown. So you gotta be careful which crown you're talking about. Well, once you found Booties, the ice cream cone, remember Arcto Arcturus, you find the ice cream cone, find the Northern crown right over here. If you draw a line from booties up through the crown, it's going to point you at this little keystone shape right here. That's the body of Hercules. Now, Hercules doesn't look much like a man. I guess you could kind of say it that way. I draw these as two legs coming down, and I never draw this line in the picture. So we got a leg here and a leg there. This is his body with his shoulder across here. Then I just draw an arm, arm up to this star and an arm up to these stars, and I don't put these other two weird bends in there. It looks like he broke his legs or something. And then I use the star for his head. Lots of people draw him the other way around, and these are his legs up here, and these are his arms, and he's fighting with the Hydra from mythology. The, key, the thing I want you to be able to find, don't worry whether you see the man or not, is to find that what we call the keystone shape, like the keystone in an arch. The reason you want to find that is because a little more than halfway up this side, right about in here, is a really cool object you want to find. And you need, you see this with binoculars, though it is better with a telescope. Shut the lines off. You can see it right here. It's got the very romantic name of M13. Well, M is Messier. He saw this in the in the 18th and he labeled it M13. This is a globular cluster of stars. There are about a half a million stars in this group. And uh, this, these globular clusters are all pretty much older stars. You know, these stars can be billions of years old. And they, they are around the edge of the galaxy. They're not inside it as much as they're around the edge, like a halo of these globular clusters around our galaxy. And we find them around other galaxies too. So they're a common thing, but they're really beautiful. And when you look at it with a small telescope, it kind of looks like a pile of diamonds or a pile of sugar or salt. Uh, through binoculars, it's gonna look like a fuzzy star, kind of like a round fuzzy star that someone tried to erase with a bad eraser perhaps. A lot of things tend to look like that in space with, with binoculars or very small telescopes. This one is 23,000 uh, light and in 1974, when they dedicated the Arecibo Radio Telescope and Puerto Rico, you can collect radio waves from space. But you can send them into space, too. And they sent a message to M13 to be right overhead that during the ceremony dedication. And people protested that we shouldn't be doing that. Because after all, what if there are aliens at M13 and they get our message and come and shoot us spray guns? Well, the only problem with worrying about that that I can see is that it takes our message 23,000 years to get there. And if there are aliens there, they're not going to get a message for 23,000 years. And if they want to write back, it'll take another 23,000 years for the message to get back. I wouldn't sweat the ray guns yet, but um, it's an interesting story, isn't it? But that's M13. It's the brightest globular cluster in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, if you go to Australia, there are a couple in the Southern Hemisphere that outshine it. But for us, that's the best one. And it's right there in 
Hercules or in that that uh, keystone shape. So now let's back away here to just take a look at what we've seen so far. We've kind of been in the southwestern sky and up high in the northern sky. We've got the big bear, the great bear. Bang down, we finally kill the lion. Minor, the Little Dipper, and Bright Star Polaris. Not nearly it's famous for where it is, not because of its brightness. We arc to Arcturus, we find Booties the ice cream cone, or Booties the, the, the kite. Then we see the northern crown, and we find the keystone. Now we're going to drop way down to the southern sky, way down low. Let's zoom in a little bit on it, right about in here. And I want to go a little bit later in the evening. We've been looking at the sky around 10 o'clock. You see, I have a secret plan. I'm going to keep you up all night long till the sun comes up tomorrow. So we need to move a little bit further. Let's go to midnight. Let's speed this up just a little bit. As we do, we find the stars are rising toward the east and setting towards the west. And we are almost there. Let's stop right about there. We're just past midnight now. And the reason I did this is there's a really good constellation. You can see most of it at 10 o'clock, but part of it dips below the horizon at that time. At midnight right now, it's totally above. So look down from, you see booties and the constellations we've been talking about. Come down here, you're going to see a bright orangish reddish star. Some nights it looks very red and some nights it just looks kind of orange. That's mainly an effect of our atmosphere, how deep the color is, though it actually is a red supergiant star. It's a star named Antares. It's right here. Uh, to give you an idea of this size, remember I said the sun was over a million times bigger than the Earth? If the sun were the size of a moon, the star would be, um, oh my goodness, it, bigger than a battle. It's a huge star. And it marks the heart of Scorpius the scorpion. So to see the scorpion, think of this as his heart. The body goes up to a head right here to the star. Come back down past the heart, the body comes down and the tail curls around and scorpions, as you know, have a stinger. And those two stars represent the stinger at the end of the tail. Now I draw it a little differently than they do on here. I come up to the head then I come over here and I make a little triangle for one claw because scorpions have claws like lobsters. Come back to the head, come down here and make another little triangle for the other claw. They draw the claws out from the heart like this and they don't make the little triangles. It's however you want to see it. That kind of looks like a scorpion too. Now, when this constellation was first made, you know, 2,000 years ago in the days of ancient Greece, because this is a, one of the constellations of Greek origin, they drew it even differently than I do. They had the same tail, the same heart, but the, the, they gave it bigger claws. One claw came all the way up to this star and kind of made a big triangle like this. That's a big claw. And this one came all the way up to this star and made a triangle back like that. Kind of a scary scorpion, isn't it? Now, these two stars that they were the old ends of the claws are now part of the constellation of Libra, the scales. But back then, they were part of the scorpion. And those two stars have really cool names. This one's name is Zubinel Shinub, uh, no, excuse me, Zubin Shmali. And this one is Zubinel Janubi. Z Zubin Shmali. Excuse me, Zubinish, Zubinish Mali means the northern claw, and Zubinel Janubi means the southern claw. So some stars have really cool names, and those names come from ancient Arabic, and uh, they're descriptive of the what they were when they were originally part of the scorpion. Even though they're no longer considered part of the scorpion, they still carry those names. Now, if you have some binoculars, Here's a cool thing to find with binoculars. Go down to the end of the scorpion's tail and zoom right in here. And you're going to find a couple really cool, what we call open clusters. Now, we saw a globular cluster here a few minutes ago. See the tail right there? There's the stinger. Just to the left or the east of the stinger, you're going to see this group of stars right here. Let's get it centered. This is called Ptolemy's Cluster. And Ptolemy's Cluster is also known as M7 another one of Messier's catalogs. And it's just a cluster of stars. These are all young stars. Now, remember I said the globular cluster like M13, where there were half a million stars, they were all really old. Those are globular clusters. Open clusters are always young stars, only a few million years old. 
Now, that sounds old, but for stars that last for billions of years, being a mil million couple, you know, say 50 million years old, that's kind of like being a, a fifth or sixth grader if you're a human being. So these are young stars. These form from, remember the pink patches we saw in the galaxy? Those are big clouds of hydrogen gas, which is what stars are made of. They, the gravity pulls them together, they condense into stars and they slowly turn into these open clusters. So this one's called M7. This one over here, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's M6. This one's M7. This one's known as the butterfly cluster and it's a little bit further away, a little bit smaller in the sky, but it's actually quite beautiful to look at. Let's zoom in on it a little bit. You can see a little bit of color and nebulosity there. And you can see both of these really easily with a pair of binoculars. One thing that really stands out with the butterfly clusters is it's got that one star that's orange, which means it's a little different temperature than the others. So they're really, really pretty to look at and really worth your time to search out. This butterfly cluster is 1600 light years away. So it means it takes the light 1600 years to go from there to your eyes. So when you look at it, you're not seeing it the way it looks today. You're seeing it the way it looked 1,600 years ago. Well, this one you see looks bigger. It's not really bigger, it's just closer. This one's only 780 light years away. So it's only half as far away as the other one. And so you can see it a lot, lot bigger and a little bit more dispersed. That's just because of our proximity towards it. So that's right by the tail of the scorpion. Now, right to the left of these two clusters, you can still see them right there. And there's the tail of the scorpion is a great summertime constellation called Sagittarius. And Sagittarius was this, a centaur. A centaur is a creature that's half man, half horse. And if that's not complicated enough, he's supposed to be shooting a bow and arrow. So look at these stars here and see if you can picture half man, half horse shooting a bow and arrow. And if you can see that, you're doing way better than me. And most people today don't even try it. Just the way we didn't make Bodhis try to look like a man, we made them into an ice cream cone or a kite. People turn this uh, into a teapot like this. So this is Sagittarius. This, but we, you, and you'll often see it listed in books as Sagittarius the teapot. Here's the base of the teapot. We've got a side here with a spout. We've got a side over here with a handle. And here's the opening on top with a lid. So there's Sagittarius the teapot. When you find that teapot, you'll notice what looks like steam coming out. That's the Milky Way. That's our galaxy, which we're going to take a close look at in a minute. But within our Milky Way, remember when we saw that galaxy with all the little pink patches? We can see one of those in our galaxy right here. This is called the Lagoon Nebula. And this is one of those patches of light like we saw in the other ones. But this one's in our own galaxy. And the lagoon is only 5,200 light years away, whereas those galaxies were millions of light years away. And this is where those, those clusters, like we just saw, like Ptolemy's cluster or the butterfly clusters, if you'd been around, let's say, 100 million years ago, is those clusters wouldn't have been there. There would have been one of these nebulas there instead. And here you can see some stars forming from this nebula. So this is a cloud of hydrogen gas. And uh, the Lagoon Nebula is about 110 light years wide this way and about 50 light years wide this way. So this really big cloud of gas and it's slowly pulling together because of gravity and they clump together in these dark clumps. And it, when the pressure builds up enough, there's enough pressure in that clump, that fusion starts happening in the, the center of it, then it turns into a star. If you could come around back in 100 million years, this won't be here anymore there'll be a cluster of young stars like we saw down in those two clusters we just looked at a moment ago. So this is a really beautiful one. It's called the Lagoon Nebula, M8, another Messier number. Right above it is one of my favorites. Uh, this one is much smaller. Where is it? It's right here. It's called the Trifid Nebula. So this one's a smaller one, but it's got a little more color to it. Now the colors, we got blue and we've got red, and then we've got some dark lines in there. When you deal with nebula, nebulosity like this, what you have is different reasons they glow. The red color comes because these young stars that are just starting to shine from these nebulas give off a lot of ultraviolet light. And when that ultraviolet light interacts with the hydrogen gas floating in space, it stimulates it and makes it glow, and the hydrogen glows with red light. The blue light is the same gas, but there's no hot stars immediately near it to excite the gas and make it actually glow. What you have instead is stars a little further away and they're shining on it and it's reflecting the starlight. 
And that's reflecting with the blue light because it's just reflecting it versus it glowing. Now the dark lines are, so we have, this is called an emission nebula because the gas is glowing. The blue is called a reflective nebula because it's reflecting light. And the dark lines are an absorption nebula. Those are dark clouds of maybe dust and gas and it's absorbing the light. And, and so it's just blocking the light from the, the, the gases behind it that are emitting light. So you see all th three types of nebulosity in that nebula right there. So they're side by side and we see another open cluster up here. This one's M21 and uh, this is M20 and this is M8. They're in the order that he kind of noticed them in the sky. And they're right above Sagittarius, the teapot. So that is uh, some things in our Milky Way. That's, oh wait, I'll shut that off and clear that out. Hold on a second here. Let's shut that one off too. There we go. That's what I want. Now, remember I did a look at those galaxies, those edge on ones, because I wanted to show you. Well, we're going to look at our own galaxy here. So we're going to zoom back. You, If you've in Rangeley, you've probably been out when you could see the Milky Way arching overhead, this band of faint light that looks kind of milky. Now, this sky that I have here is actually more like the sky I would have in Waterville, where I live, in the countryside around here. You're in a much darker region being in Rangeley, Maine. And uh, your skies are going to look a little bit clearer, maybe more like this. You get to see more stars because you have less light pollution. It's a big deal. If you live in Boston, you don't get to see the Milky Way at all. But look at that Milky Way. Think about those galaxies we looked at edge on, and you can see a similarity here. We can't see the whole thing because, of course, our horizon gets in the way. But if you could like leave the Earth and be floating in space, then you might be able to see the whole thing because you wouldn't have the, our planet getting in the way. Well, the nice thing I can do here is I can get rid of the ground. It's like we're just floating in space. And if we zoom back far enough, look at that and think about that hamburger galaxy or, or that surfboard galaxy. Now, all these other stars out here, these are all part of the Milky Way too, because we are inside the Milky Way. Remember, it's flat like a Frisbee, but round. And we're halfway through the thickness, so we see a few above us and a few below us. But when you look into the thickness, you see a lot more. And if you took away the stars that are just around us, so you just see the thickness of the galaxy, it looks even more like that hamburger galaxy, doesn't it? right there. And you see that's the central bulge where we know there's a giant black hole because just a month or so ago, we got to see a picture of it taken with radio astronomy. So this is our galaxy right here from the outside, if you're outside the earth looking at it. Well, I think it's even prettier with the stars about us. And let's come back down to the earth and we're gonna travel back up that galaxy, come way up overhead and we see three bright stars dominating the Milky Way overhead. It's called the Summer Triangle. It's Altair, Deneb, and Vega. These three right here. Now, that's not a constellation. That's another asterism. It's just three bright stars that dominate the summer sky right in the middle of the Milky Way. Each one has its own constellation. Let's start with the eagle. Right down here, Altair. I'm going to put a little a bit of haze here. I know the sky is, to me, is more pretty this way, but if you want to learn constellations, having a little bit of atmospheric haze takes some of those faint stars away and it helps you see the ones that make the pictures better. So we'll bring a little atmosphere back. So Altair is the beak of the eagle. Now there are lots of ways people draw this eagle and I haven't found anyone but me that draws it the way I draw it. I don't, they are, you usually see it as the eagle flying with the wings out, something like uh, something, oop, I got it connect one here, something like that. I don't picture it that way at all. I picture it as an eagle sitting on the branch of a tree. So let's give him a branch hang on to. Start with the star, come over to this one and over to those two. Those four stars make up the branch he's sitting on. You know, the way you see one perched in a pine tree somewhere. So there's his branch. The two middle stars, this one and this one are his two claws grabbing the branch. He's got a foot right here and a foot right there. This is the eagle's body right here, this kind of oval shape with the tail dipping down below the branch. These are his two shoulders right here. And this triangle, 
marks his head. You could pretend to color it white for a bald eagle if you want. And the bright star Altair marks his beak because eagles have big, strong beaks. Now, I can't draw it with lines the way I see it. I wish I could. I don't have the programming skills to program it into this. And then no one else draws it that way. But to me, that's I see that every time I look at the eagle. He's just sitting there. Don't look for any wings. He's perched. And they fold their wings in when they perch. And you might notice he's looking off to the left or to the east. He's looking at this little group of stars right here, which is known as Delphinus the dolphin. This little diamond shape is the dolphin's body with a nose on front and a fin on his back. And his tail comes down these stars here like this. We can put the line on him because that's actually pretty good for a dolphin right there. So we've got an eagle, this oval shape, sitting on a branch, watching a dolphin jump out of the water. Well, that's just the beginning of our nature scene. Up overhead, if we look way up here, we find Deneb, the next star in the triangle, and that's the tail of Cygnus the swan. To see the swan, we just draw a line between these two stars, and that's the swan's body. We've got a big wing coming off on one side. I usually draw a line back to the tail to make a big solid wing. And another wing coming way over here. And I draw a line back to the tail again for the other wing. Then a long neck with a head way down here. Now that head is a, a lot of people's favorite star. It's a star called Albirio, just like Algeba, which we saw in, in, the, in Leo the Lion. This is a double star, which also happens to have different colors. Again, another blue, and this one's kind of an orange star. So it's a really pretty one to see with a small telescope. You won't be able to split that with binoculars. You do need a telescope to split it, but it splits pretty easily. Now, lots of stars are double stars. They're not uncommon, but there's only a few like that which have really distinctive colors. So I just showed you two of them here tonight. Now, we saw a star, remember the Owl Nebula, which I said was a star that exploded, that died when it pushed the outer layers away. Well, some stars die by exploding. When the sun dies, it will not explode. The outer layers just get pushed away and they'll create a planetary nebula like the Owl Nebula. But right off the end of the, this arm or this wing of the swan right in here is a nebula from a star that exploded. And this star is uh, exploded probably about 15,000 years ago. It's right here. And it's creates something we call the Veil Nebula right here. This, all this stuff was once a single star. And this is pretty hard to see with almost any telescope, but it turns out if you're a photographer, it's actually pretty easy to photograph. You know, a 30 second exposure on a tripod looking at the, by the sky, it can, it, it can show up pretty well. Uh, if you take a longer exposure, it shows up even better. And this stuff is expanding outwards from the center. And this is what it looks like after 15,000 years. It's about 80 light years across from one side to the other. But when it was a star, it was a single star. So this expanded a long way. It's 2,500 light years away. And uh, so it's a fair distance. When that star exploded 15,000 years ago, it would have been as bright as the full moon. So imagine it would still look like a pinpoint in the sky, but it would give off the same amount of light as the full moon. It would have caught anyone's attention who was living on the earth at that time. Now we may someday see a star in the winter sky, a star named, excuse me, named Betelgeuse, which is in the shoulder of Orion, a very famous red star, which is a giant star, which will explode one day. People got excited a couple of years ago when it dimmed down quite a bit. And, uh, but they think it just burped out some clouds of dust and dimmed its light down, but it will explode sometime soon. Soon being within the next million years or two for a star, that's pretty quick. But we do find places in the sky where stars have already exploded, and this is one of them. Now, you might say, well, how can you tell? How do you know that that is a dead star versus the lagoon is a place where stars are forming? Well, scientists look at these things with spe spectrographs, which basically takes the light of the object so through a prism to make a spectrum, which is a rainbow, basically. And what we find is when you take the light of a star and spread it out, spread that rainbow out, kind of stretch it out. There are little black lines going through it. And those lines are created by the different elements, like hydrogen will create a certain set of lines. Helium makes a different set of lines and so on with different elements. And if you looked at the Lagoon Nebula, looked at the spectrum, it'd be almost all hydrogen. If you looked at mi middle-aged stars like the sun, it's mostly hydrogen with a little helium. You look at a star like Betelgeuse that's ready to explode and it's got lots of lines of lots of different elements. And when you look at something like this, 
you can find the spectrum of gold and silver and all kinds of other really heavy elements in here. For you see all, if you have gold earrings or silver earrings or a wedding band, you should realize that the gold in your wedding band was created in a supernova explosion. If you take your finger and put it on your nose, your nose is made of carbon and water and a few other things. The carbon you are made of was created in one of these explosions as well, or the core of a giant star. So little did you know, you've all been blown away in a supernova. Now, that doesn't mean you were created there. It means the atoms you were created, you're made of were created there. Interesting thing to think about. Well, let's go back to the third star in the summer triangle. Remember, we had Altair and Deneb and Vega. Vega is the brightest of the three, and it's in the constellation of Lyra the Harp. And to me, it doesn't look anything like a harp. It's just this little parallelogram. But there is another star. Remember, we've seen two double stars. This star here's name is Epsilon, uh, I'm sorry, Lyra Epsilon. And with our eyes, it looks like a single star. Now, remember I said double stars aren't always different colors. And these, this is, this is a multiple star, and, but it's, they're the same color. So you quickly, with binoculars, you can split it into two. So you can see it's a double. That's kind of cool. Well, that's actually pretty common. Take your telescope and look at them more carefully. We've got to get it centered here so we can really zoom in on it. And what you find, if you look at them, that each one splits into two. That one's two. And if we go to his companion over here, that one's two. So this is known as the double double. So it's actually, even though to your eyes, it looks like a single star, it's actually four stars and they're all gravitationally bound together. That's an interesting marriage, isn't it? <laughs> well, look down low and here we're just after midnight and there's a bright star coming up on the horizon right here. And if you looked at that one with your telescope, what you would find is it's not a star. It is the planet Saturn. Saturn comes up just after midnight right now. Saturn's the second largest planet in our solar system. It's a gas giant. You can't land here. It's all clouds and gases. And uh, it's 700 times bigger than the Earth. So it's a pretty good sized planet. The rings are made of ice, mostly water ice. So likely you could, if you took a chunk of Saturn's rings and melted it, you could drink it. You'd have to work pretty hard to melt it though, because it's frozen down to more than 300 degrees below zero. So it's ice that's as hard as granite. It's not a sheet of ice though. It's not like a frozen lake. It's not like Rangeley Lake in the wintertime. It's, uh, it's chunks of, it's more like the ice you have in a soft drink in the summer. Lots of little chunks uh, without the soft drink, of course. And, you know, it's like, 30, 40,000 miles wide from outside to inside edge. If you measure the thickness from top to bottom in places, it's no more than 80 yards thick. Some places it might be uh, maybe half a mile thick, but most places it's less than 100 yards. So if you tipped up the rings on edge and set them down at the 50 yard line of the Super Bowl, there's a good chance they'd fit between the goalposts and extend thousands of miles into the sky. Wouldn't that be a halftime show, huh? So that's Saturn. Now, you may have heard that we've got what we call a parade of planets going on right now in the sky. Well, the problem is, if you want to see them, they're really cool to see. I got up not this morning, but yesterday morning to see them. You've got to get up just before sunrise. So I told you I was going to keep you up all night. Let's move to just before the sun comes up. We're just after midnight here. We're at 1230. So if we do that, looking to the east, you see the stars coming up over here in the east. Let's back off a little bit. And the planets start rising. Now, you often see several planets in the sky, but right now you can see the five visible planets. So stop right there. And you see we're just before sunrise here, but we have five planets in the sky. We just found Saturn. That one you can find at midnight. The thing with planets is sometimes they're really faint, sometimes they're really bright. And you see two very bright ones here. This one is Jupiter. This one is Venus. And in between them, the one that's a little close to Jupiter there, that's Mars. Those four are the pretty easy ones to find. When I will get up yesterday morning, I saw Venus just fine, and Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn. The one I couldn't see, and I looked and looked and looked, and I, had, I didn't have my telescope, but I had binoculars, was this one right here. And that's the planet Mercury. So we have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, 
all visible in the sky right now, all at one time. And they're in the right order. Now I've seen times when I could see five planets, but they're all mixed up. And it's not that they're mixed up. It's just the angle. We're looking at them where they are in their orbit. You might see, you know, Venus and then Jupiter and then Saturn, and then Mars or something like that. Uh, but right now it's been like the first time in a long time. And I don't know the exact date the last time it happened when you could see them in their proper order. So we've got them right here. The only two that are really interesting to me to look at with the telescope would be Saturn, which we've already done, and Jupiter. Jupiter is always fun to look at because you can see cloud bands with a little telescope. You can see these two dark bands going across the surface. Jupiter is a gaseous planet like Saturn. No one's ever going to put a rover there like we did on Mars. It's all clouds and gases and liquids deep inside. But the wind blows through those clouds at hundreds of miles an hour and it stretches them in long bands. And you can see those bands. Jupiter is a thousand times bigger than the Earth. The other thing that's fun to see are the moons. These four dots, one, two, three, four, are moons. And in this program, they're oversized. They're not going to look quite that big. They'll look like little stars, but they'll be in a straight line right along the equatorial region. And right now, they might be, they're off at this, these angles like this, but they'll always, you won't ever see up on top or down here. They're always along this line. And they'll move from night to night. Right now, we've got three on one side and one on the other. Uh, the other night, we saw three on all on one side, and I couldn't see the other one. It was probably behind the planet. And you go out the next night, they might be all on one side or all on the other side, and they, they, they move from night to night. Sometimes you can see their motion slowly uh, just over the course of a few hours, you'll notice the difference. So those are the planets you can see right now, and they're all out in the early morning sky, and if you really want to see them, you need to get up about 3.30. That's a good time. By 4, a little after 4, the sky, the sun's not up yet, but it's so bright, it's going to wash out Mercury for sure. And soon after, the other ones will disappear too. So that's our sky. We've been through the whole night, and uh, the sun's just getting ready to come up up here in the, the northeast. Let's bring her back up, and uh, we can say we're up all night long. So you can see, watch those planets, and you can see they're starting to fade out. And in real, real life, they fade out even faster. Because by the time the sun's up the way, we've just brought it up here, you won't see any of them anymore. Now they're fading. And there they go. Oh, it's not even up. Here we go. I thought it was. There we go. There's the sun. And you see they're totally gone. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the sky here today. I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Let's uh, shut those lines off. <laughs> I'm pressing the buttons thinking I'm knowing what I'm doing. Luckily, I didn't do that while we were teaching today. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if anyone has any questions. Any questions out there? You can write them in the chat if you have any. No? I guess you're an easy group to please. I hope you all get outside and take a look at the sky. You have great skies in Rangeley. And... Uh, you get a clear night, you've got unbelievable stars. Uh, I've been part of a group called Dark Sky Maine, and we've been helping uh, places like we've been working with the Range of the Lakes Heritage Trust and other land trusts around uh, to help promote dark skies and to help work to keep our skies dark. And all that means just uh, turning your lights off when you don't need them and making sure you have lights that shine down towards the ground and not up towards the stars. Well, thank you for the, the, the comments. I appreciate that. I hope you enjoy us. And hopefully, maybe later this uh, in July, when we do this around the new moon at the end of July, uh, we'll get a clear night and I'll get to come to Rangeley and we can all stand under the stars together and look at the sky. Because as much as this is fun, it's way cooler to be under the real stars. Thanks, Sarah. That was a great evening. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, John. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we will have one again. I believe it's July 27th. Um, it's going to be at our EcoVenture campus. Kind of cross your fingers that we're going to have good weather. And you know, we have not had this best luck with it the last few years. So we're going to hope that we can finally get John up here in person so that we can all kind of sit out 
and see the stars in person, which would be great. Yeah, um, I get this great laser pointer. You can point right at the stars with it. It's really perfect, awesome. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. We're gonna hope. Um, as far as uh, Range Lakes Heritage Trust goes, we are starting walks in the woods of Saddleback, Maine on Saturday. Our first one is this Saturday at 9 a.m. at Cascades. Um, so please, please come. Um, we'd love to have you guys out on our trails and everything again. I know it's been a while since we've done one of these with COVID. Um, so it'd be great to start kind of seeing people in person again. Um, again, it's at 9 a.m. You can go on our Facebook and register. Um, pretty much the same way they registered for this. Um, we'll kind of keep you updated probably Friday if the weather's not looking so hot. Um, but definitely we'll kind of send out an email blast that morning too if the weather turns out not so great. But hopefully you all enjoy your night and go out and actually look at some of those stars.